Hi everyone, thank you for joining me in this video where I'm going to be showing you a pretty neat in-game custom pet system and painting program for Vibrant Venture. I've always wanted the game to be more customizable and to give the player tools to express themselves by creating something unique that wouldn't directly affect the gameplay. So this is what I came up with, a pet maker. I didn't want the pets to be pre-made by us, I wanted them to be made by you. And this meant creating an in-game editor. Now, this wasn't easy to make and it took a long time, but based on what I've seen my friends using it for already, I think it's worth it after all. The first and most daunting task was to make the pixel art drawing program inside of Unity. Now, the reason for that is that I think it would be very neat if you could create the pets inside the game without having to exit it and launch some kind of external tool. Although this is quite difficult since you have to go in and make your own pixel art program inside of a game engine, which isn't really meant for that kind of thing. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that that's exactly what I did. Let's have a look at how it works. The first thing I did was to create an empty UI with a white texture on it to use as a canvas. The texture itself is 32 pixels wide and 32 pixels tall, which means this is the size limitations of whatever pet you want to make. Then after that was done, I converted the screen space mouse position into a local grid coordinate, where the bottom left on the grid is 0, 0 and the top right is 31, 31, making it a total of 32 by 32 pixels. Now, textures in Unity have a built-in method called setPixel, which takes in the X and Y coordinate as well as a colour, and we can use that to set the colour of our texture here. Using this method, we're now able to place down pixels at the cursor's position using the grid cursor coordinate that we calculated earlier. So this is the basic idea that we're going to expand upon in order to create more tools. The next tool I'd like to make is, of course, an eraser. This works in the exact same way, but instead of putting down a colour, it removes the pixel by making it transparent. Now, it is quite boring to only work with a single colour, so the next thing I did was to create a colour wheel. This is actually just a texture, and when you click on it, it samples the texture's colour at your cursor's position in order to set the pencil colour. I also went ahead and added sliders for the red, green and blue channels, as well as input fields so that you have full control over what colour you're using. By the way, have you ever wondered why the red, green and blue, or RGB channels, are represented by a value from 0 to 255? Well, to figure that out, we need to talk about bits and bytes. A bit can only have two values, 0 or 1. This is the simplest way a computer can represent data. A byte is made up of 8 bits, meaning that we can have 8 values that all can alter between 0 and 1. Because a bit has two possible values and a byte consists of 8 bits, a byte can obviously hold 2 to the power of 8 values, which equals 256. Now, bytes are quite tiny and they take up very little space, so the RGB system is based on 3 bytes, one for each colour channel. As we just calculated, each byte can hold up to 256 values. This means that one single colour can be represented by up to 256 to the power of 3 values, which is an astounding 16,777,216 individual colour values using just 3 bytes. So using this, we can store images very efficiently, which to a computer is just made up of bytes. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked, so let's get back to the pet maker. I went ahead and added a few sliders to control colour brightness and saturation. In the code, the brightness and saturation are just a decimal number between 0 and 1. Now, in order to apply these values, we convert the active RBG colour from RBG to HSV, which stands for Hue, Saturation and Value. Then we multiply the saturation and value channels by our saturation and brightness values in order to get the desired result. Now that we have full control over the colour, we should probably get back to adding a few more painting tools. Since we're already talking about colours, we should probably add a colour picker tool. This works in a very similar fashion to the colour wheel, but instead of sampling from the colour wheel texture, it just samples from the canvas texture that you've drawn on, 
and then it sets the active colour to that colour. Another simple but rather useful tool I added is a grid toggle, which, as the name implies, allows you to easily turn the grid on and off. At this point, the game's artist, Jewel, suggested that there should be a way to move the entire texture in any direction using the arrow keys. I couldn't help but agree, so let's talk about how I implemented that. Let's assume the user presses the right arrow key on their keyboard. This initializes a vertical scan on the far right, which checks if every single pixel there is fully transparent. If not, we cancel the request because moving to the right would move it out of bounds. However, if every pixel is indeed transparent, moving the texture to the right won't actually move it out of bounds, and so the movement algorithm starts. First, it grabs every single colour in the texture, and then it stores these colours in a two-dimensional array. Then, it loops through the array and offsets every pixel to the right. Once this procedure is completed, it then uses this shifted array to set the texture's pixels, and then it applies its changes. Since we need to handle all four directions, the algorithm ended up being a lot more complicated than I first anticipated, so nothing new there. Now, the final tools that we're going to create is a line tool and a flood fill tool, both of which are rather complicated. The line tool uses a C-sharp implementation of Bresenham's line algorithm, and the flood fill tool is implemented using the Q-based forest fire algorithm. In case you're interested, I'll leave a link in the description below to articles describing these algorithms, and I'll also put a link to the source code for the Unity C-sharp implementation. Now, most drawing programs implement undoing and redoing changes, so let's talk about how we can tackle that. We first need to create an array in which we can store every change the user makes to the texture. This array will have a fixed size, and I decided to allow up to 16 textures to be recorded so as to not use too much space. I also figured that most people probably won't even undo or redo their changes more than a few times anyway. But we'll just use an array with 5 spaces for the sake of demonstration, since it'll make it a lot easier to understand. So here's our array, and we'll need an index value to act as a pointer to the current history index. For every change the user makes, we store the texture's current colours in the array and update this pointer to point to the last element in the texture array. Once the array has been filled out, we shift every texture in the array to the left and add the newest texture to the end of the array. When the user presses undo, we decrement the index pointer and then we fetch the texture stored in the array at that index. Likewise, when the user presses redo, we increment the index pointer and fetch the stored texture here. Once the user starts painting again, we can then erase any entries in the array after the index pointer since the user will have reverted to whichever texture they desired. With our undo and redo system complete, I suggest we figure out how exactly to save and load these pets. Now, since the pet texture is already made up of bytes, this is fairly simple. Unity has a built-in PNG encoder, which simply converts a texture into an array of bytes, representing a PNG file. Using that, we can then call the system.io function file.writeAllBytes with our newly generated byte array to then save the texture to a location on the machine. And you can see this working right here. Now, we need a way to also open these PNG files again, and this is equally as simple. Since a PNG file is really just an array of bytes, we can then use file.readAllByte to then open it as an array of bytes, and then use that to generate our pet texture. But what's the point of a pet if it's just a static texture? That's no fun, so let's talk about animating. Instead of just storing a single texture for every pet, we can store multiple textures using a list, and then view this list as our animation keyframes. This took a few days to program, but I eventually got a timeline working with a few buttons for adding and removing frames, as well as copying and pasting frames. I also added a UI that allows you to play and pause the animation, or change its speed. Now, in the same directory where we store the animation frames as PNG files, we can also store any relevant data about the pet as a JSON file, like its name, the animation speed, and so on. 
I then spent a few days expanding this idea by adding state machine support. This is because walking pets need an animation that corresponds to every state that they can be in. Like for example walking, idling, falling, swimming and so on. Finally, I went ahead and added a few quality of life things like being able to change the size of the brush. And then I implemented a UI which allows you to change pets inside of levels as well as actually accessing the pet maker itself. And now it was time to finally implement the pets into the levels so that they would actually follow you around. This required some basic AI for both the walking pets and the flying pets, so after I got that working, well, I think the results speak for themselves. So yeah, I think we're finally about done with this pet maker. This video took a very long time to make, so I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a like if you enjoyed, and maybe even share it with your friends. This pet system will be part of the next update for Vibrant Venture, which you can buy now on Steam, link in the description below. Thank you for watching, and until next time, take care. Bye.